Welcome to welcome back to the European Conference on Education and to the European Conference on Language Learning. And I'd like to uh, welcome you, or oh, vous souhaitez le, le bienvenu, uh, to our um, conference. And um, uh, you you threw me a bit there because you you started speaking another language at me, another language at, than English. How dare you? It's uh, it's very strange. It's very abnormal. And um, I'm, ver <laughs> I'm very cognizant of the fact that um, we've got people um, for, for, for this conference from, a, from around 40 or 50 different nationalities. And um, what's more, of course, is, is a lot of those people from different nationalities are, are people like me who um, live and work in, in different countries. And um, so this, this, is, this is something um, that I think is is running through a lot of the attendees at IFOR conferences. This this idea that that you're you're born in one place and you've with with one language and you develop maybe um, or, or need to develop the ability to speak another as you as you live in a, a different country. So um, I'd like to welcome you to this session. And this session with is um, with uh, Professor Jean Marc Devaille, who is um, a, a professor at Birkbeck University of London. He is um, a, um, a very, very well-known and high-profile researcher in SLA, Second Language Acquisition, and Multilingualism, Bilingualism, and also on psychology and the psychology um, of language learning. And um, I have known Jean-Marc for a, a few years now, and um, I've always enjoyed spending time with him and always enjoyed sort of um, uh, speaking to him on, on a number of different things. But... Uh, we, we have a shared passion, and that passion is for, for languages and, and for language. And so I thought, well, it might be quite a nice idea to do something of, a, uh, of an interview, of an interview with this man. So um, thank you for accepting um, the, the, inv the invitation, um, and um, we're going to get the ball rolling. So first of all, hello, how are you? Hello, Joe. Good, uh, good to see you, and uh, thank you for inviting me for this chat. No problem. So, um, uh, when, when when you uh, spoke to me just a bit there in French, um, it's it's quite interesting because um, there's there's a part of if you get, that gets thrown when you're addressed in one language and you're expecting another. Um, and I, I, I imagine we'll 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 come to that in. Um, in in as we go along but what what was happening there what was happening when you when you said something to me in in a language that e even though i understood i i was like well what's what's going on here well i guess when i see your face i switch to french when i see your name on paper or in email then i don't switch to french okay um so it, it's really to do with the with your face <laughs> <laughs> to do with my face c'est un visage français is that uh, j'adore le français and I, I just love that having that special connection with you okay so so it's so 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 therefore there's there's something very much linked to um to the person and to the relationship you have with the person and to the language that you choose that you choose to sort of um use or employ or maybe you don't choose to use or employ maybe it's just an intuitive sort of sense of this this it, is what i'm going an, to do yeah an instinctive reaction i would say a little okay. bit like um, you, you see a child or you see um, a family member and automatically you switch to the language you typically start with, uh, right. with that person. Right. So I, I have the same with you. I see you and I, I switch to French, okay. which is my language of the heart. The, langu the language of the heart. So is French your first language? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Um, uh, I, I grew up um, in a French-speaking family in Flanders, in Belgium. So uh, Dutch was everywhere outside the home, but inside the home, we only spoke French. So I, I obviously learned Dutch pretty early um, and I did all my studies in, in Dutch. Um, so I would say that these two languages are really my first languages. And, okay. and only much later did I learn uh, English, uh, age 14. And then age 18, I uh, studied Spanish uh, and, and learned Spanish. But I've never become as proficient in, in, in Spanish as in English, obviously. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to ask then a bit more about the context because you, you said um, 
and and you've you've come to be known for um, for your study of bilingualism, and so in 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 this respect, essentially you're studying something which which you yourself um, sort of uh, or a situation in which you yourself grew up. So what what why why do they speak two languages in Belgium? I mean, g- give us a bit of the context. Okay, well. Um... Belgium is officially a, a bilingual country. In fact, there are three national languages, so uh, German on the eastern side of the country. Uh, then there is um, the French-speaking part of Belgium, including Brussels. And then there is the Flemish-speaking part uh, of Belgium, which is in the north, um, where they speak Dutch or Flemish. And um, it used to be the case that the, the Flemings used um, French among themselves, those of the um, higher social classes, the bourgeoisie. And uh, I guess my grandparents uh, were bourgeois and so used um, French with my father and his brother in Ostend. Um, and then my father decided to continue that tradition with his children at a time where it was in fact no longer politically correct to be okay. using French because French was seen as socially ostentatious uh, by the Flemings and uh, the relationship between the two language communities is pretty tense. So speaking French in public in Flanders um, draws attention and hostile reactions okay so um, we we'll, we we we'll, we're certainly going to get to a bit of that later but so even as a child you were you started to become aware um as you became politically aware of how language uh, in itself was was sort of politically loaded the the, yes. the language you were using was um was maybe subject to either raised eyebrows or or maybe um or, or maybe more yes I, I, I cursed my parents for not speaking the local dialect with us, just like all my friends. So why did we have to stand out? Um, and, and then I would say that it triggered my research in bilingualism, really. Uh, when, when you experience something and you don't quite understand why, um, uh, I would say it triggered a lifelong interest in bilingualism and, and all the issues to do with language identity, uh, right. groups, and, um, uh, and, and then you have to develop um, survival strategies, both linguistic and social. So uh, I enjoyed, I, I, used, I played the clown to uh, involve, uh, to avoid getting beaten up for speaking the wrong language. <laughs> so so, so f- from that thing, then, in, in this, this very formative age there of becoming and also of belonging, because you were saying language is, is, is clearly a, um, a very, uh, a very good signifier of of belonging or not, and um, of course we have that within countries. But as as you pointed to as well, we have that within uh, within class, within dialects, and um, the, the way in which we we um, choose to speak, or the way in which we're um, uh, forced to speak by um, by those around us. So um, that's okay. We're 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 going to come to that a bit um, uh, a bit later, but. You you said um, French is the uh, the language of your heart. What 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 do you mean by that? And um, like, yeah, what 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 do you mean by that? And when did you first become aware of language as as something um, which was more than uh, a tool? Right. I, I I guess it is something that I discovered when I arrived in the UK uh, in nineteen ninety four. And um, I realized that I understood the words, but, but I understood very little of the, what was actually meant in staff meetings with my colleagues. So I, I was joking that I couldn't read between the stiff upper lips okay. of my, my colleagues. And, um, so, and especially when they were expressing uh, emotions. Mm. Um, they all seemed extremely cool and um, in control of their emotions, whereas in Brussels, where I had studied and obtained my PhD, I had taught French there, um, people showed their emotions much more freely and, and 
it could involve shouting at faculty meetings or banging the table. And, and those were behaviors I never witnessed uh, at, at Birkbeck. Um, and, and I realized that I was missing a lot of, of the humor also. Um, and, and it has taken me a long time to um, acquire, I would say, these social pragmatic skills uh, to understand what is not said, um, what everybody else realizes should have been said and was not said. Right. I realize that that's in fact one of the toughest things to learn uh, yes. in a foreign language. Yes. And absolutely. how people feel and how ex they express their feelings through gesture, facial expression, um, silence. Uh, it, 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 it takes a while to get used to that. And so I, I got interested in that and then started uh, doing research on multilinguals and on the process of acculturation, because I realized that I myself and my wife have been through a process of acculturation where we kind of um, tuned in to British norms of verbal and nonverbal behavior. And it typically strikes us when we return to Belgium uh, and, and uh, our Belgian friends or family members um, express surprise at the way we behave, which we realize is no longer quite the way we used to behave when we were still in Belgium. For example, we don't shake hands as readily uh, anymore. Um, we, we, we tend to avoid the uh, kissing on the cheek, which is absolutely expected in Belgium. Um, and um, well, one of the things I realized also when I arrived at, uh, at, at Birkbeck was that I was shaking hands too often. And then I noticed my colleagues <laughs> recoiling in horror when I was yet again uh, wanting to shake hands. <laughs> and then I also re remember a, a little uh, mm. incident where I was at a staff, the very first staff reception in the French department. And I was talking to my head of department, and we both had a, a, a glass of uh, cheap wine uh, in the best uh, British academic tradition. Uh, and, and he was taking a step back, and I was taking a step forward, and he kept making a half step back, and I kept making a half step forward. <laughs> and I remember thinking, why is this guy retreating? You know, I'm not threatening him. And, and then it, it dawned on me that, in fact, I was threatening him. I was invading his private space, and right. I realized that in Belgium, it is fine to be at a half arm length distance of your interlocutor, that, that's okay. But it, here in the UK, I realized that in fact, it is a full arm length. So if you come within that distance, the, your, your interlocutor will feel uncomfortable, right. might not want to point it out because it, it, it's a bit, it, it would be um, awkward, but, but steps back. And then, um, a couple of years ago, I was back in Brussels at a reception with, with my uh, colleagues and friends. And at some point, I realized that I could smell the peanut on the breath of one of my interlocutors. And I thought, ooh, and I took half a step back. And then he took half a step, half forward. A step forward. I took <laughs> half a step back. And then suddenly it dawned on me. I said, oh, damn, I've turned into a Brit. I've turned and, and into I, I, Yeah, mm -hmm. I kind of laughed because... The, um, the, these are exactly the, the acculturation phenomena that I'm interested right. in and that, experience, that I experience without even unconsciously. Yes. So there are lots of things that you do unconsciously as you adapt to uh, local norms, both verbal and non-verbal. Well, that, that's one of the, um, one of the things I, I thought was interesting as well with the, um, I, I know when, we, when the coronavirus pandemic um, first sort of took off. Obviously, this this thing of um, uh, social distancing uh, was was very much there, and I and I sort of thought, well, the English should be all right in the main, um, and um, the, the the Japanese absolutely. Um, you know, you're you're not getting within a within a mile of them. Um, but then I sort of thought, you know, and, and the fact that it did sort of take off in Italy, where you do have a very tactile culture and a very um, sort of, you know, the the the, the kissing, the hugging, the it's 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 um, it's wonderful. And and I'd, I'd like to to offer also um, uh, certainly mirrors to that thing of knowing how to behave 
And and when you're um, and I, I've certainly stepped in it several times as um, with with my position at, at IFO, particularly if it's a networking sort of party or something. I mean, there's some people who essentially are expecting bear hugs, and there's some people who for, for whom a preferred hand is you know a no go, and and you're you're sort of negotiating and navigating you know, sort of in in those spaces, and of course. One of the one of the wonderful things is, is, of course, in many ways it is a minefield, but of also in many ways it's a testament to the um, to just how together we are. In other words, most most people don't mind that you take a step forward or a step back. Or it's it's just it's just that we're we're not necessarily wired as as, as you are now to sort of um, be be looking for those things. But mm -hmm. let's 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 go back to your uh, at what point then did you because this what what you're saying to me is you is you're a highly Highly empirical thinker, and you're you're looking at um, what, what's around you and, and what's happening to you, and going, oh yeah, and and sort of writing it down, sort of this this uh, I suppose self Darwinist sort of um, exploration, if, if 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 you will. So when when did you um, when did you get interested in in the idea of how you acquire languages and how you acquire second languages, and how does this fit in with the uh, with the bilingualism or the or the multilingualism? Well, I guess I was interested in how people acquire languages being a, a foreign language student myself. Um, I, I wondered really why there were so many individual differences. Why was it that some of the students excelled at some parts uh, in, of, of the foreign language, uh, others did really well uh, on, on other parts? So, you know, I, I've, it, it, it's a difficult issue, but I never quite acquired a, a British accent. Um, and I decided early on that that was a conscious choice of mine, which, which is a lie, of course. <laughs> um, I, I can imitate a British accent, but never for long, and it doesn't quite fit with me. So right. in the end, I decided that, that I am perfectly happy with having a foreign, lang uh, a foreign accent in English. In fact, um, it, it sounds more like a French accent, so the British tend to find it cute. Um, that's what I heard after the job interview when I got my job at Berkeley. <laughs> so so it, 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 it's okay to have a French accent in English. Um, but so, so I, I, w I was really interested about individual differences. I, and later on, that motivated me also uh, in my uh, teaching. I taught French as a foreign language at the University of Brussels. And again, I noticed that some people were really good at it. Others struggled, and and a couple were indifferent and demotivated and didn't really care. So I, I looked at um, variation. W what kind of variables are linked to progress uh, in second language acquisition? Is it linked to personality? Is it linked to motivation? Is it linked to cognitive factors like aptitude or memory? Um, and that's I would say a, a lifelong uh, interest. And then I remember also being interested in the embodied part of um, the language performance. And um, I, what, I remember- sorry, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Uh, uh, let me explain. Um, I had to um, do oral examinations with about 300 students, <laughs> 300 students at the end of the year. Uh, it was in late June, early July. It could be quite hot. Um, and I rather naively started uh, doing um, the interviews with just uh, a table and a chair for the student and, uh, and for me a chair on the other side of the table. And I asked them, uh, you know, to uh, we had the conversation and, and I had to judge the quality of their French. And it struck me how often these students were, were um, perspiring and, and, and I remember thinking, well, why didn't take, they take a shower, you know? <laughs> so I started opening, opening the window, um, and then I realized that the window was not enough. So I think I ended the session with two tables uh, between uh, the student and myself, and I sat near the window. And I realized, in fact, just how anxious these uh, students were when they had to talk in French. Right. Uh, and obviously, it was an exam, so it was stressful. Uh, but, but then I realized that language performance is in fact about much more than just 
uh, abstract uh, grammar rules. Uh, it's an embodied uh, experience, which means that you can shiver, you can sweat, you, right. you know, uh, it, it, it's normal. I, I, I think that's a fascinating thing to pick up, and I'm, and I'm um, constantly minded of, uh, uh, of my own experiences in, in speaking uh, foreign languages or trying to attempt foreign languages, and I, and I, I speak a few to, to, to sort of differing degrees. Um, one, one thing is, is, is I think just how um, humbling it is to, um, to, to learn and operate in, in a foreign language. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's interesting, but you can be the um you know the the sort of um highest performing or you know occupy a senior position in in whatever it is and and be very very useful to um sorry very very used to using language to display power and 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 to sort of say you know how how brilliant you are and wonderful you are and 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 how everyone you know sort of loves your jokes and everything like this and then and then suddenly you 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 operate in a foreign language and and you're and you're left very, very much um, powerless. And this, this, this has actually um, um, made me uh, really, really um, admire hugely uh, well, people like yourself who are operating in what isn't their native um, language when they're engaging in English. Because it's, it's almost as though we feel, um, as, as, a, as a native speaker of English, I, I, I feel, well, yeah, sort of, it's the norm. Everyone else speaks English, and of course, the thing is, is, is they don't, and they will have had to go through um, uh, a, a variety of um, great, great trials and difficulties in order to get to to a situation where they're able to converse and, and go back and forth. And again, I know, I know myself having having studied French for a long time, having a doctorate in French studies, that um, uh, that if I am arguing with a French person. I would prefer to be doing it in English, even though I have, um, you know, I, I've done um, however many years of study. So, I, and and I get, and I remember when when you were talking about the perspiring, it, it sort of almost triggered something in in me, some sort of PTSD of remembering being <laughs> being at school of of thirteen or fourteen, and and of course in in England all the exams are in the summertime, so it's and and there's it, it seems to be that whenever there's a, an exam. That um, the weather is very, very hot, unusually hot in England, and and so it brings back these memories of of, of yet yeah, really being very, very anxious at, at what would be produced at, at this this expectation as well of, of of what you might hear and 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 of how things might work, and of course of you falling off that cliff because it is very much a cliff of where you're going from A to B to C. It's like yeah, I'm following, we're doing okay here, and then suddenly I have no idea what the person is talking about. And that's an incredibly scary feeling for, for an adult, I think, who's used to sort of mastering their, 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 um, their surroundings a bit. And, and an incredibly important exercise, I think, for those people. And, and I, I think that's one of the reasons why we perhaps continue um, as language learners in, in, into later life. So we, we can, uh, it, it becomes a bit of a thrill that, that, that tightrope of when you're, you're first speaking to someone in, in, in a different language and, and the uh, yeah the, the the thrill and the enthusiasm that comes from it. In fact, if I may add, Eva Hoffman talks about this beautifully in her book Lost in Translation, um, where she describes herself um, acquiring English as a second language in Canada uh, as a teenager and feeling clumsy and feeling like an astronaut uh, in a suit. Um, unable to be the sophisticated, funny self that right, she could right, be uh, right. in, in Polish. So, yes, yes it, it is um, taxing uh, to be using a foreign language. Though after a while, obviously, you do get used to it. And I guess that you do develop a Teflon layer um, about sniggering comments about your accent or your you know, the, the proposition that you used in the wrong place, etc. Well, so... Well, so well, yeah. So, no, so, so okay. So, so let, let's let's just park on that a bit because it's it's something uh, and, and and this 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 is wonderful for me because I get to be uh, to ask a lot of the questions and for those of you um, watching, please please do um, add questions or, or throw comments in because we'll um, we'll leave about fifteen minutes at the end for um, to pick up on those things. But I, I was just thinking in terms of identity because um, with 
within your own language, you can shift shape a bit and you can decide to speak, um, you know, in a different way or identify or, or, and, you know, some, sometimes, uh, in, because of my, my family background, I, I was, I was born sort of, um, to a, uh, to a family where, where my father spoke in a very sort of working class sort of, uh, South, uh, Southeast English sort of like London sort of accent. And, um, and then my mother sort of spoke with sort of like unmarked RP. She was a university lecturer. And, and so I, I, I sort of would shift between the two very naturally as, as a child. And of course I've, I've, uh, I've sort of gone gone more more my mother's way in terms of occupying uh, this position, but um, when I'm when I'm down the pub or when I'm watching football, then I, I, I I'll, I'll shift back into something else. But the, the the question I have for you then is is so when I'm speaking French, I'm aware that I can play different roles in French. I'm aware that um, it's I, I could. I could, you know, decide like to sound like Charles de Gaulle or something, or or or, or, or decide to slow things down or speed things up, or or occupy things um, that for, for which I have no sort of agency or, or no um, sort of like direct link. And 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 I wondered if you might address something along that because um, I'm sort of getting this like politicization of language because a lot's been made of uh, this this idea of of um, those people who can or can't you know properly um, like speak a language almost because they have the agency to speak it and yet um, language is very subversive in 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 that way because you're able to to recreate a completely different story for yourself and a completely different dimension and a very very clear example of that is English does have and, and and French does as well. This uh, a class identifier to it. If, if you speak in a certain way, you can you can be ah he's one of the uppers or one of the whatever. But yet, it, when you shift from one to another, somebody hearing somebody speak English say with a slight French accent is not going to know whether this is whether you're I don't know some aristocratic sort of some of Henri IV or something like that, or whether whether you're 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 from 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 the back streets of of some other place, and that allows you uh, a, a sort of escape into a different a new identity. I, I wondered if you had something to say on that. Yes, I, I think I avoid the social class test uh, in the UK because I'm identified as being somebody with a French accent. So, yes, so exactly. there, there, there is no class um, aspect to it. Um, and uh, it was funny, as, as you were speaking, I was thinking of my daughter who grew up here uh, with three languages, in fact, uh, Dutch, French, and English. Uh, and um, I remember she went to a, a preschool um, in Muswell Hill. Um, and it was a relatively, it was a private preschool. It was relatively posh. And, and, and the children there and the parents spoke relatively RP uh, English. Um, and she picked up that social act. Um, and after going to that preschool, she went to a primary school in a relatively rough neighborhood um, with lots of children on uh, free school meals, which is an indicator of lower social class. They, they were speaking a very different social act. And yes. for some reason, uh, Livia decided to stick to her original um, um, accent and, and, and never let go. And, uh, right. and, and I remember that one of my PhD students met her and she says, oh, your daughter, she, her English is so posh. And, you know, she, she, she was maybe eight uh, by the time. But, but it is true that um, ch children make some kind of unconscious decision about what register it is that they will stick to. Um, and, and they, so they, they may have opportunities to shift um, varieties, um, but sometimes they, they can be pretty pleased with, with the, var the variety they have chosen and, and how that um, identifies them right. as member of a particular group. Yes. And, and that, and that, that of course is, is one of the interesting things as adults as well is, is, is you get almost a sort of re- Refined a sort of a, a part of childhood. I, me I, I remember going to France as an eighteen-year-old and sort of being confronted of, of who do you support? You know, like um, do you support Paris or do you support Marseille sure. in, in terms of the football? <laughs> and I was immediately think, 
I don't know. I've got this choice. I've got a wonderful choice in, 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 I can choose all these appurtenances, which, which for the past, whatever, 18 years I'd, I'd sort of built to me, you know, you, you, you couldn't really very easily switch from this to this here, but, but I was faced with this. I can decide to be someone completely different. And I, I can, I can, I can write, I can write my own history if you like, or rewrite my own history from scratch. I, I think that's it. That, that's in fact, probably one of, of the, um, attractions of learning a foreign language. It, it offers you the opportunity to build an alternative identity. Right. Uh, and, and that's exactly what you described. Like, are you a fan of Paris Saint-Germain or Marseille? Yes. I mean, that's a crucial thing in France. Yes. But it would never occur to anyone in the UK that that could be part of your identity. Right, So right. learning a foreign language is, in fact, creating a new self where you can be either more disinhibited uh, inhibited. Uh, yes. you, you know, you, you're allowed to do things that you yes. wouldn't do in your in your first language self. Yes. Well, so one one thing, and and um, this this um, this would connect us then to to swear words, um, or or and and I know I know a lot's been um, been made of this, but um, I've I've heard different people in different languages say, you know, oh, it's swearing's a lot worse in our language than it is in your language, and I I always find that funny. It's like, well. Not to me, it isn't because I have no idea what you're talking about. So therefore, it doesn't matter. You know, you could be saying the worst things you like in the world to me with a smile, and I wouldn't care. But um, what what um, what is it then when we are um, when we're learning um, different languages that um, allows us to to not be to feel viscerally in the same way um, when when we're sort of using these. Uh, when we're using these different words or, or enables us to do, because I've, I've taught a lot of um, uh, students who've employed what, I, what, I, what I've called is like inappropriate register. But um, this, essentially they've been uh, overly familiar or um, swearing or whatever. And I've, and I've just, that's, that's I, I'm not someone who disapproves of that per se. I'm just saying in this particular context, it's, like um, not appropriate, so that's that's one of the difficult things in language in in terms of register. But why why would we um, uh, feel perhaps more comfortable employing language? Is it is it also like a shield for us? Like if it's easier to say perhaps I love you in uh, in another language, as perhaps it's easier to to swear in another language. Is is that the case, or is that just an intuition I have? Uh, uh, let, let, let me start by saying that even in the first language, um, children learn um, to appreciate the emotional resonance of languages, uh, of, of specific words and expressions. So it means that they may hear a swear word uttered in their environment. They notice how people react to it. They remember who was saying it, what the reactions were. They might remember that it is okay to use that word with your friends because you know you might earn street cred using that specific word, and people may smile and, and encourage you to do that. But then use that same word in the classroom, and the teacher will uh, slap you and, and tell you that you know that that is absolutely <laughs> unacceptable. So, or, or your mum might slap you around the ears um, for for using something that is totally inappropriate. And I remember. Uh, my own reaction when um, Livia used the word merde, uh, she, I think she was two, she must have been two, and she looked at me and she said, merde, papa. And, and I was going to say, but you can't use that word with me. And then it dawned on me, of course, that I, I, I was the source of that yes. word. Uh, um, so I couldn't really tell her off for using a word that she had heard me using. Right, right. Um, so I think that's different between first and foreign language use. Uh, in that um, the first language emotion words have rich multimodal representations. Right. So they are linked to uh, memories of parents, friends, teachers, the reactions, okay. their reactions when you use that word. Um, it, it might even be linked to smells of the classroom at that moment. Or um, So these are rich connotations that add to the emotional resonance. However, if you learn uh, emotion words, you know, expressions of love or swear words in a foreign mm -hmm. language, 
you you learn it's it's in a relatively clinical context right. where you know you you might come across the the teacher might teach you that word but it's just a funny word really right. and so it's you, not going to have the, those those links to like maybe shame or or um, exactly. humiliation or or, or whatever uh, that that the others uh, would uh, uh, absolutely so it is much more detached okay um, it, it doesn't have these rich connotations um, which means that you can come across that word without actually sitting up when you 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 hear it right. and and the danger is that you might use it too freely you might yes. not realize just how offensive that word is yes um, yes like for example it has taken me years to find out what the c word is in english because it's such a taboo word that it never occurred in my daily interactions uh, and and some day i i asked my colleague malcolm uh, edwards um, a linguist in the department and i say you know malcolm what, what would you say is the worst swear word in english and he said oh that would be the c word and yes. i say oh yes i have seen this c yes. word thing but i have no idea what the c word is i said well, I, i couldn't possibly tell you i, I can spell it out it is c u n t and i said cunt <gasps> he jumped up he, he yes. was so shocked he said yes I said, "Wow, that's pretty powerful." Then, yes. uh, and so I, I did. I did research then uh, yes. on the C word, and I discovered that indeed um, it, it is one of the most offensive words in the English language. Yes, um, and, and that foreign language users typically do not appreciate just, just how, how offensive, offensive it is. Might be. Yes, yes. It's, it, 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 it is. It is interesting. Then, in fact, I, I am uh, up, up until the age of twelve or thirteen. I always wondered what my mother was saying when she said he's a bit of a see you next tuesday um and, <laughs> and that and that was the the euphemism of of whatever and, and what I, i think i asked when i was about 13 and she sort of um, gave me gave me a look one of these <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, which 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 maybe st started my my lifelong sort of interest as a researcher but <laughs> there you go <laughs> Okay, so I'm I'm going to move on. There's a, there's a, there's a few questions that I had uh, thrown at you before, um, and I think I think we've we've uh, we've we've done um, sort of a contextual thing of, of who you are and what what interests you. Um, but I've I've got here a, a question, a very leading question. But hey, this is an interview. Um, what are the big questions or issues that you grapple with as a teacher, as a researcher, and as an individual? And when I wrote this question to you, I put big. B-I-G, and I capitalized a la Donald Trump, the B-I-G, to, to sort of uh, underline the, the sort of the bigness of the, of the issues. The, 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 there are multiple issues that I grapple with. Um, I, I, I would say that it is mostly to do with positioning. Um, how, what, Uh, in my position as, in fact, a British academic, what can I do to, what little thing can I do to help my readers or my students get rid of prejudice? I right. would say that that is really my mission in life. Uh, there is nothing that uh, I, I get more upset about uh, than bigoted, prejudiced people who think they know the truth the truth, who, who think they know something about languages and multilingualism because they happen to speak a language. Right. And so there are self-appointed specialists. Uh, and, um, um, and then they can have opinions that are completely false. Um, and I rather enjoy, um, you know, first year BA students who have these prejudices, for example, that they don't speak good English despite the fact that they are monolingual English speakers. Yes. And I say, well, that, that's obviously uh, wrong. That's Be not quite true, yes. It, it, it's what you described earlier. You, you, you are a perfectly good speaker of certain varieties of English and certain social acts of English. Maybe your academic English isn't very developed, but that doesn't really matter. And it doesn't mean that you speak bad English. And, and in that sense, I would also say, that foreign language users often blame themselves for not being good enough. And, uh, and, and I tell them, well, you are good enough if people can understand what it is that you are saying 
or if you can understand the newspaper or you understand what they are saying, you know, you don't need to be perfect. You need to be able to use the language uh, as a communication tool. If that works, then don't blame yourself. So you're essentially using a position of authority, which is as a foreign or non-native um, speaker of English, in order to say to these people, "Hang on, you've you've got some responsibility and accountability here." In in um, that you speak this language naturally. Um, and sure, you're going to need a bit of work towards it, but um, yeah, there's no excuse. Yeah. And, and so what infuriates me, for example, was something that happened when uh, Livia was, um, I think, uh, three or four years old, and um, we had to visit a health visitor, uh, and um, the health visitor noticed that I was using French with her. Um, and so uh, he said, oh, uh, you're speaking French to your daughter? And I say, yes, of course, I'm speaking French to my daughter. In fact, my wife uses Dutch with her. Uh, and, and as you hear, her English is fine. Oh, but you shouldn't be using French or Dutch. That will confuse her. I said, well, sir, I happen to have a PhD in applied linguistics. And what you are saying there is absolutely, totally wrong. And, and you know, a child can grow up with multiple languages and have no problem. It won't have any negative cognitive effect. And, I, and in fact, I'm still angry thinking about it, and I'm, I hope fewer people have these reactions or say these things, because I could, of course, jump up on my high horse and, and, and show that, you know, I have a PhD, I know about this. Um, but what if I had been, you know, a poor refugee, Somali um, right. mom, uh, single mom with, with kids, etc. Would I have abandoned my first language to speak broken English with my child? Can you imagine what harm that would have done yes. to, to my child, to my own mental health? So I, I feel very, very strongly about that. Right. It, it, it's the, the, the stupid things that people can say about languages and multilingualism. Well, again, I, I think that attests to, to the importance of, of obviously research in this area where, where we can... Um, do you know longitudinal studies which 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 say well look, come on now that's there's no link whatsoever between sort of um between this and that you're you're this this is very very clearly false and and there's and there's all sort of any number of uh research studies showing that bilingual children in in, in enjoy an immense number of um uh sort of uh, advantages yes advantages and and Beyond the very obvious one, of they they actually speak two languages, um, and, and 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 therefore have this this other bridge into the world. And the I so I I like that. It's, it's a very good answer. The um, it's a well done. I'll hi, good boy. <laughs> it's a very very good answer. That that um, in order to attack a big question like prejudice, you're able to to sort of chip away at it here. And then, and, and then also see because uh, although it remains perhaps a, a sort of a, a dip, distressing moment, it's actually to see okay here was the attitude. This is the attitude that we are changing, and I think this is this is the attitude that in that we we can say we, we have changed. Um, certainly, the, the majority of the way people um, think of that. I'd, I'd hope that um, uh, that that really is something that's going to be a thing of the past going forward. Um, if, if, if I may, <laughs> you know, the, it is an episode I describe in, in the, the book uh, oh, okay. on, on my daughter. It's also um, one of the points I made to my students over the years that despite her growing up with three languages, uh, she always managed to have the highest score in English. So, so it was uh, at, at any level, um, she always managed to beat the monolingual English kids. Uh, right, of course, right. I mean, it's just anecdotal evidence that it is perfectly possible to grow up with multiple yes. languages and still outperform the, yes. the monolinguals in the classroom. Yes, yes absolutely. Um, so so this, this, is, this connects this, um, but and this is a short but wide question. How does language inform you as a citizen? And, and, and you can take this as how does language inform one as a citizen and then, and then you? You can take it as both. I, I think that, it, um, that I have reflected a lot on, on the monolingual ideologies about citizenship. 
um, that I am obviously opposed to uh, these monolingual um, uh, ideologies, um, in, including the language tests to obtain citizenship, um, as if you need to have a score of say 80 right. or 90 percent or, or on, on some um, you know, complicated grammatical structures right. uh, in, in the language in order to become a, a good citizen. Uh, that link, I think, is fundamentally wrong. Uh, yes. You can be a, a very good citizen even if you speak the language, you know, uh, or only in a relatively limited way. Um, if, if you're um, a, an artist or a musician, does it matter whether you speak English well and should that be used as a judgment to allow you to become a, a British citizen? And, and it's not just in the UK, obviously, it's all around the world. Where, where these language tests are in fact used to um, stop immigration, uh, w w which I think is totally unfair. And, and in fact, I know that my uh, linguistic colleagues in language testing are very uncomfortable uh, with the use that is made uh, of their tests to act for, for yes. purely political uh, yes. um, ends. But of course, that, that, that's, that's a very interesting point, isn't it? Because whenever you're involved in, in any form of, um, uh, of, of, of testing, your, um, the, the ramifications of, 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 of okay, exactly what is this test for? How's, how's it going to be used? And often people will take up the tests that are meant to be directed for one thing to show this yeah. and then to show something completely different. And, and as, as you say, that's, um, th that is worrying. Um, a question here, um, next question. What are the particular responsibilities of the language teacher as opposed to those who, who teach in other subjects? I think that the, the language teacher um, has the potential to open up um, perspectives for students in ways that the other teachers don't. So of course, if you're a history teacher, you know, you can teach them a lot about history, etc. But I think that the language teacher has in fact, the opportunity to um, strengthen the resilience, the well being, and the happiness of students in listening to what they have to say about themselves, preferably in the foreign language and in engaging in, in meaningful interaction about the things that matter to them, to the students. Right. Um, and, and I think it is really, um, uh, I, I remember that at the start of my career, I had um, rather um, stupid ideas about what it was that I had to teach. You know, I thought that it was important to talk about international politics and all serious issues, etc. in my conversation classes. And then I realized that my students weren't necessarily willing to talk about these things. They, they were willing to talk about things in French, but not the things I thought were interesting. Yes, yes. yes. So, so I think it is really important to zoom in on what it is your students are interested in and then allow them to talk about it. And in fact, by verbalizing the issues that they are grappling with is in fact good for their mental health. And I think that that is one of the crucial jobs of, of, of the language teacher. It, it's not just the teaching of grammar rules. It right. is looking after your students, making sure that they are um, happy, healthy, and that they will grow up as, as critical thinking citizens. I, I, think, I think that's, that's, a, that's a, really, um, it's a really interesting response. And, and, and also um, your, your earlier um, sort of phrase there into all these, these other serious topics, um, of course, it does underline this, this sense in, in which um, you become the embodiment uh, of La France, you become oh. c'est moi la France, you know, and and for, for those students, this is this is the first person often who represents that country and 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 that 
that place. And and so your the the remit of of what you you're to cover or what you might do is 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 so enormous. And as yes. a diplomat, you you sort of think of oh look, I've I've got this, I've got this, I've got this, and you've, you're meant to come out with the history, the politics, the food, the the everything in 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 sort of representing the um, the country. And I suppose in 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 your case, it would have been um, I'm representing the country and um, of Belgium, and they're like no no no, it, it's it's France, please, because that's what the textbook says. Um, okay, um, last last one before we go to um, some questions. And, and again, if if you're if you're watching this, I've 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 kept an eye on the chat, and we'll um, we'll get to that there. Um, we I think we may have covered this, but um, you might want to say you want might want to just give a, a short response, Jean Marc. Uh, how can language show belonging, or difference, or or alienation? And so that's the question. Yeah, uh, I would say the moment you open your mouth in any language, you will be categorized. And, and you could be wrongly categorized. And, and it could be a category that you didn't even have in mind. And, and it obviously depends on the context. So, you, you know, um, being in Japan, um, walking in the street, I, I would say that I felt very much like a non Japanese person because of the overwhelming. Um, uh, majority of, of, of Asian-looking people uh, in, in the street. Um, I don't have that impression when I walk around in London, where I, I walk around and I say, oh, what I love this, uh, you know, ethnic diversity. I, I love hearing all these languages. I, I, I love smelling different types of food. Um, so uh, um, the language is very much linked to um, our, our identity. And I guess that it's one of the pleasures of being a multilingual. It's probably the reason why I enjoyed, why I started saying something in French to you, because we share that common, um, we, we have that bond that we've shared these two languages and that we have this wide interest in other languages. So our categorization is in fact that, that we are multi-category. Um, and, and I love to hang out with people who belong to multiple categories. Um, I, I love the heterogeneity um, of, of, of the multilingual world. And, and I think also that, that is in a way a crucial thing is that the fact that you belong to multiple categories is not a threat to any specific category. Uh, because I think that's one of the problems uh, and that's the hostile reaction of that health visitor. It's that they think that speaking another language with your child right. will mean that the child will not be a loyal citizen of the country in which he or she grows up. Um, or will somehow which be psychologically is, damaged by, exactly, by these dual apartments. Psychologically and politically damaged and, and will somehow be rootless because they will have too many roots. And, and that's a, a very um, old fashioned idea that bilingualism uh, is that you are in a category and you can never move from it. The, right. the whole modern thinking in multilingualism research is that it is dynamic, that we are in fact constantly changing in, in subtle ways, like, you know, my shaking hands or not, acculturation is affecting us all um, in some ways. Uh, we, and, and so it is rather silly to say that you can only belong in one category and that anything else is a threat. That, that's silly. So, so we have to uh, combat that and laugh it off really very good okay so um uh, we're now going to turn to um some things i've been looking at the chat thing um the chat box and these and these questions um uh here there's there's one on rp that's received pronunciation um uh for i suppose most of you um probably do know this if you've if you've had to sit through english classes um, do you think that RP, and this is uh, Geetha who's asking, do you think RP should be taught in schools? I know that teachers of my own mother tongue, and that's Tamiz, used to be very keen that we pronounce all the words correctly. Otherwise, we would end up spelling the words incorrectly. No, yeah. uh, I've never been involved in debates about what variety of uh, language to teach. Um, I personally rather enjoy hearing RP because that's in fact the, the variety that we were taught at school. Um, and, and I struggle a little bit with the uh, regional variants. 
I find them wonderful, but I'm, I'm not necessarily used uh, to them. Um, but, but then, you know, I, I don't see why the English teacher in Newcastle uh, wouldn't be allowed to teach the Newcastle variant of English uh, and the same in Liverpool um, or, or New York or, or, or Johannesburg. Um, so like, I, but, I think but, but surely there are, um, uh, I, I would agree in that I, I think accent is a nice thing, but when, when variant goes too heavily into dialect, it's, it, it, it would, it would sort of defeat the point that this is, this is something, you know, I mean, because I mean, France has, um, whatever it's meant to have two, 300 identifiable different sort of, um, dialects or patois. And of, and of course this one's used in this particular context here. I mean, it, it wouldn't be of tremendous use. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. It is good to be teaching the standard language because that's the language that will allow the, the, the students to communicate with the widest possible audience. Um, but whether a teacher may have some dialectal inflections, that, that, that's perfectly yeah. okay to me. Don't sweat it, type thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, and, then, and then she continues, and, and this was on the comment on the health worker. Nowadays, health workers encourage parents to speak in their own mother tongue because it's good for development. So again, that's, that's, that's um, a very clear example of, of uh, she says here, to underline that your research is having impact. So people who, who are doing research on this who will be able to say you know um because obviously in these things there are iterative processes if if the health worker is reporting to their boss look i i think there's a cause for concern here there's some evil nasty belgian who's um, <laughs> marauding around the british countryside speaking speaking in tongues to you know we need to address this and and hopefully at a certain policy level it's like no 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 that's that's perfectly fine and and then that's a case of training um, it's Lady Delith um, who said, I've enjoyed this so much as a bilingual Welsh English speaker with a French degree. So, um, so many things correspond with, with her experiences. And she said, she says, merci, she says thanks, but she also puts what I assume to be thanks in Welsh. Um, Lovely. And, and would, would anyone be able, there's Delith, she's, she's come like, can you give us thanks in Welsh then so we can say it? Diolch. 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 Dioch. Lovely. Dioch. Okay, thank you very much. Dioch to you. And, yeah. and um, she, uh, yes, so, so in, you know, a, a lot of those experiences there are, are, are reflected. And then finally, we've, we've got something from Vola Ambininsoa, who says, I would be very interested in knowing the main variables. Oh, okay. This is, this is a big one that make every learner different which you mentioned briefly earlier in your research, did you find some patterns? I, I don't know if you'd have time to go over too much of that, but there you go. Well, I mean, the... Just briefly, um, one of the interesting things is that there is no psychological profile of the good language learner. Right. In, in, in the sense that just like millionaires don't have specific psychological profile. So what makes you a good learner is in fact a combination of psychological factors, but also uh, uh, about, you know, how good is your teacher? Um, how, ha have you had contact with the target culture? Um, have you fallen in love with the speaker of that language? Or do you know, do, do you love martial arts in Korean? Um, we have a lot of, of students who take up Korean because they, they do Taekwondo um, or, or, or they enjoy the Korean music scene or they enjoy Korean food and they want to know more about it. So it, it, it can be the starting point for uh, a language learning journey. So, so it's really um, a combination of cognitive factors, you know, musical ability, uh, aptitude, um, short-term, long-term memory, uh, and, and, and then a lot of contextual variables. So there you go. I would also, just going back to um, yes. the, the, the speaking the mother tongue, um, yes. just also insist that there is some um, hypocrisy in that politicians will typically encourage um, uh, people to learn foreign languages, but they would typically encourage what I would call elite bilingualism, meaning that, you know, um, people with money would be happy to pay a tutor to teach um, French or Mandarin or um, you know Russian to 
to their child, um, but forget about Punjabi or, or Hindi. And, and, and yet we have plenty of Punjabi and Hindi speakers in the UK. And I'm wondering, in fact, why is it that we have so many speakers of these minority languages and that yet um, schools don't teach some Hindi, some Punjabi, uh, some Arabic, in fact, to all students, should, right, shouldn't we right. all have a, a basic knowledge of the languages used in the country uh, and not just focus on elite bilingualism? That's interesting. Uh, that's, that, that's an interesting point, or, or at least, um, you yeah, know, greetings and, um, yeah, some, yes. some, some basics to, yeah, yes. absolutely. Okay, well, uh, Jean-Marc, we've we've come nearly to the end of the the road, but I but I threw in um, a couple of questions at, at at the end and gave you a bit of chance to uh, to to think on these. And this this is um, uh, inspired by the uh, the apostrophe uh, pivot questions there, and um, and these two questions for you is what is your least favorite word and what is your Brexit. favorite word? Your least favorite word is Brexit. Is Brexit. Absolutely. And I've 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 um I've actually seen that uh, I don't know whether you read about this, but people um suggested that this be be included as a as a sort of a catastrophe type thing, like a fair un Brexit, or you know I I don't know whether you could do it as a reflexive should it be Brexit day or something to indicate um, that you really got yourself in, into a pickle. What's your favourite word? Serendipity. Serendipity. Mm. Serendipity. There we go. Well, and what does serendipity mean? It, it, it's the being in the right place at the right moment and enjoying the fact that you are just there when the sun was shining and that beer was fresh and your friends had stimulating conversation and, and it was unplanned. It, it was like it happened. That, that, that's the greatest joy. And uh, I, I love that English word. Okay, well, um, uh, Erica Ranzato has just pointed out both of the words are English, but I, I think serendipity exists in French, does it not? Mm, I have to look it up. I haven't used it in French. <laughs> it doesn't, or maybe such a thing, such a concept doesn't exist in French. Um, yeah, who knows? <laughs> but in any case, it's, it's very uh, serendipitous that um, I met you and um, indeed that you were able to join us through, through Zoom. I enjoyed that uh, immensely. Uh, I hope you. I hope you did too, and um, I look forward to, to seeing you, uh, Jean Marc. Um, hopefully soon in in London, and um, to everybody watching, I hope you enjoy that very much. And we're going to go away for a short break, so I encourage you to get yourself a cup of tea, coffee, hot milk. Uh, yes, Jean Marc. Can I add that those who want to hear more of me will hear yes. me talk about um, flow uh, tomorrow. Ah, yes, uh, Jean-Marc will also be presenting one of the parallel sessions on flow. And if you don't know what flow is, well, you're going to find out. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll see you after a short break.